Hello, everyone. Welcome to this collaboration between GSAS Conversations and Columbia at Home. I am Erin Hussein. I'm Columbia College Class of 1992 and Columbia Law School Class of 1995. And I am currently the Associate Director for Alumni Relations for the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Tonight, we are very pleased to welcome a GSAS graduate Maria Konnikova to speak about the human decision making process writing about sports, the world of professional poker, and her new book, The Biggest Bluff. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature in, um, in the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit a question. We also have a couple that were submitted during the registration process, and we will get to as many as we can during the time that we have. Um, Maria Konnikova earned the PhD in psychology from Columbia in 2013, and she is a psychologist, journalist, writer, and international poker champion. She's the author of The Confidence Game, Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, and The Biggest Bluff, and has won a number of journalism awards for her writing, as well as for her podcast, The Grift. She'll be joined in discussion by Jeremy Feinberg, who is a graduate of Columbia College and Columbia Law School. Uh, he's a lawyer working for the New York State court system, a devoted fan of Columbia athletics, and one of my oldest friends. He first learned how to play poker while he was a student at Columbia, and many years later, competed in several World Series of poker events. And just on a very personal note, I first met Jeremy in September 1988, on 14J while he was playing poker with a group of fellow first year students. I'm very pleased to welcome Jeremy Feinberg and Maria Konnikova. Thank you so much, Erin, for that lovely introduction and for making this event possible. We've got a great show for you tonight, folks, and we really hope you enjoy it. Maria, it's so nice to finally get a chance to meet you. I feel like having read your book and some of your writings, I've gotten to know you quite a bit, but here we are for the real thing. And I have to start with welcome home back to Columbia, even if the best we could do was virtual tonight. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's an absolute pleasure. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be back or, or as back as, as one can be. I'm actually in Brooklyn right now and the Columbia campus has not magically moved, um, but I am really happy to be here. I had a wonderful experience as a graduate student with Walter Michelle, unfortunately, he can't be here tonight because he passed away um, after uh, I graduated a few years ago before the book could come out, but the book was dedicated to him. So we have his memory living on in its pages and I hope tonight we can honor him a little bit. Well, I thought that was as good a place to begin as any. I'd love to hear about your experience studying with Walter Michelle while you were going for your doctorate, something that is not an easy thing to do by any means. And uh, I know he's watching from up high tonight and will approve of whatever you choose to share with us about your time on campus. Walter Michelle was an incredibly special human being. Um, I was fortunate enough, my book is about luck. I mean, it's about poker, but really it's about luck and the role of chance and how, what ro ro role it plays in our lives and how we can learn to tell the difference between what we can control and what we can't and talk about luck. I was so lucky that Walter Michelle agreed to take me on as a graduate student. At the time um, when I went to interview with him, he said he wasn't taking any more students. He was done. His last student had been Ethan Cross and Ethan had graduated a few years earlier. And he said that he was, you know, he's, he was in his late seventies. He was done with it. And he was probably going to retire from teaching soon. Um, and I convinced him not to do that. I said, I really want to work with you. I've wanted to work with you ever since I first read about your work, which for people who didn't study psychology, Walter Michelle is the marshmallow guy, the guy who's known for that famous marshmallow test, how long can a child wait to eat her marshmallow? And the amount of time that someone can wait at age three or four then goes on to correlate with all sorts of life outcomes from SAT scores to health outcomes to whether or not someone's likely to use drugs to where they end up 40 years later, these kids are actually still being monitored today. They're no longer children. Um, they're now well into middle age adulthood. Um, and so that, that's the work that he was famous for. And I told him that I wanted to work with him, but that 
I did not want to go into academia. I said, look, I want to be a writer. Um, I love the human mind and I'm fascinated by how we think and what makes us who we are and I wanna learn from you. I want to learn from your wisdom, but I don't need academic publications. That's not, that's not my chosen path. And I'm very self-motivated, I'm very self-directed, just let me do what I wanna do. Um, and I will work with you, I will learn from you. And he just looked at me and he said, you know what? I wouldn't go into academia now either. <laughs> And, and he said, because Walter was also, he was a Renaissance man. He was someone who, when he got his first job at Harvard, had one publication to his name. And he didn't like that academia had become this publisher parish environment. He loved the freedom to think differently, to do other things. He was a beautiful artist. Up until his dying day, he was creating these beautiful paintings on x-rays. That was his, his new thing. And he was an art collector, he loved literature, he loved all sorts of things, and he loved that I wanted to write. He thought that the best psychologists, the best thinkers were people who had multiple interests, not people who were pigeonholed into one thing and just spent all of their, every single breath and every single moment of every single day doing that one thing. And so miraculously, the one sentence that you're never supposed to utter at an interview to a PhD program, which is, I don't want to go into academia, was what convinced Walter to take me on as a graduate student. And it ended up being the beginning of a relationship that lasted over a decade. Um, and that became a very close friendship, collaboration. And he told me many years later that I kept him teaching about five years longer than he wanted to because he wanted to stay and he was rededicated to academia. So I, I think I'm glad that I was able to share him with more students than would have otherwise uh, shared his wisdom. And he also said that he wouldn't have written his book. He wrote the book, The Marshmallow Test, which everyone should read. So if, if you're gonna go and buy one book after this, don't buy The Biggest Bluff, buy The Marshmallow Test um, as a testament to the late, great Walter Michel. Um, and he said he never would have written it had it not been for me. That's amazing. It sounds like it was a wonderful mentor-mentee relationship and one that still pays dividends to you today. That's absolutely true. Um, and you know, the the seeds of the the seeds of the book, the seeds of the biggest bluff, were born in the lab with Walter and in our discussions and in the work that we did on self-control and on something called the illusion of control, knowing when control ends and chance begins. And it ends up that the human brain loves the illusion of control. So we love claiming control, even when we're not actually the ones calling the shots. So for those who are not trained in the discipline, is the concept behind the illusion of control, the idea that you're on a hot streak and that you couldn't possibly lose because you just had three great things happen in a row or is it something else? No, it's something else. So that's the hot hand fallacy, which is also, which is also a problem when people think that they can't lose. The illusion of control is thinking that you are responsible for outcomes, even in a stochastic uncertain environment um, where there are multiple factors and you can't possibly know um, whether you actually were in control or not. And the classic studies actually were done in the 1970s at Harvard um, in the laboratory of Ellen Langer. And she did this really cool thing where she, ha she had a rig rigged study. So this is, this is one that you'd need uh, approval to do. Um, so you had to bet on the outcome of a coin flip. You had to say whether it was heads or tails. Um, and you had to predict it in advance. And the study was rigged in the sense that everyone had a number of correct and incorrect outcomes, and the experimenter knew the order in which they were going to give you that feedback um, because they could, they could basically say right or wrong however they wanted. And so in all cases, it was an equal number of right and wrong answers, as it should be, quote unquote, because people think that you know, a coin should be heads or tails 50-50, right? Um, but the order of the correct and the wrong answers was different depending on the depending on the specific experimental condition. So in some of them, people were right and wrong 
in a seemingly random distribution. And I say seemingly because it's what the human mind thinks of as random. Randomness does not think does not look like what you think it looks like. Poker cures you of that delusion very, very quickly. You realize that the cards have no memory whatsoever. Probability has zero memory. I, I write in my book, Probability Has Amnesia. And I think that that's exactly how you need to look at it. It's not normally distributed. But the human mind has this conception that randomness should look random. So in one of the conditions, it looked random. In another, people were wrong a lot at the beginning and then right a lot later on. And in a third, people were right a lot at the beginning and then started leveling off and being wrong more often as time went on. In the first two conditions, people, when they were asked questions afterwards, such as, I'm good at predicting the outcomes of coin tosses, would say no. I mean, they realized that this is complete BS. I mean, these questions are crazy because a coin toss is random, right? There's no skill in predicting whether a coin is going to be heads or tails. That's just com complete luck. I think you and I can agree on that, right, Jeremy? No question. <laughs> Total luck. No, zero skill. But in the last condition, when they were right at the beginning a lot, all of a sudden, a really weird thing happened. These people said, yeah, I actually am very good at predicting the outcomes of coin tosses. Yes, with practice, I would get better. Yes, with less distractions. If I were in a quieter environment, I would be better. Yes, if I actually studied harder, I would be better. They were giving these nonsensical answers that made it seem like they thought that predicting a coin toss was actually skill. And that's the origin of the illusion of control. And we actually replicated this. So we did this online. We did a virtual coin toss and we were able to replicate this exact same thing. To this day, people still fall for that illusion. And if they do that with a coin toss, just imagine how often in life you actually think that something is the result of your action and your skill when really it's just dumb luck. We could without a doubt talk about research that you've done or read in psychology for the entire time we have tonight, but I have a feeling that a good swath of our audience is very curious about your poker experience, and maybe I can move us in that direction. Yeah. Um, Walter Michelle was certainly not the only amazing mentor that you talk about in your latest book. Uh, Eric Seidel, who is well known in po poker circles, also took you on as a mentee. And while I don't want to spoil anything in the text because it's really well written and, and a good uh, a good read in and of itself, just those portions, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it was like meeting him and learning under him. Would you describe it like learning magic from Merlin the Magician or maybe the Force from Yoda? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny. Um, in some of the reviews of, of the book, they called Eric my Yoda. And I was saying, yeah, absolutely. He is Yoda. He's like this Yoda Buddha hybrid, um, just this, this Zen master that I'm lucky to, to learn from. So Eric Seidel is one of the greatest poker players of all time, um, someone who has been winning since the 80s, which is basically unparalleled. No one else has been able to be as successful as he has been for as long as he has been. And he agreed to take on this project, even though he'd never really taken on any students and I'd never played poker. I mean, at the beginning of this, I didn't know how many cards were in a deck. Like I really was starting from less than zero. He still teases me because I was positive there were 54 cards in the deck. And so he will still joke that when those two jokers come out, I will rule the world. That'll be the day, <laughs> that'll be the day um, when I win the world series of poker and become world champion. Um, don't worry, guys. I have learned that there are 52 cards in a deck. I'm, I've got it. I've got, I've got it down. Um, but he agreed to take me on because he was actually intrigued that I had zero poker knowledge, and he wanted to. I was, I was a very clean test case. You know, can good thinking, can psychology, can that kind of approach still win? Because these days all the new players are math whizzes. They're stats majors, they're PhDs in applied mathematics. They are people who just know the numbers and know how to crunch the numbers. And a lot of people say that that's the future of poker and that that's all that matters and that you know, the human side has, has become irrelevant. To me, that was very interesting because I see that happening everywhere. I see it happening in 
even in writing where people are trying to quantify how people read and what you're supposed to do and on what page your action is supposed to ramp up. Otherwise, people are going to put your book down, trying to quantify all these metrics. It's certainly happening in academia. It's happening in psychology where no one wants to hire social psychologists anymore, which was what I studied. Everyone wants neuroscientists because it seems more scientific. Um, and the theory has gone by the wayside. The big thinkers have gone by the wayside. People care about you know, the math and the, the nitty gritty and the, the neural structure and the neurons and, and that. And they, they forget about all of the other stuff and all of the other questions. And Eric wanted to see if thinking psychologically, thinking in human terms would still be a winning strategy if he could teach me from step one as a blank slate with zero bad habits because, because I'd never played poker. That was actually an asset in a way because I had no bad ways of thinking no, nothing that he had to unteach me. And I think the other reason he took me on was that he loves the game. He really loves it. He's passionate about it. And he wanted, I think he saw a ch chance to potentially spread that love further, to spread it beyond the existing poker community. And I didn't know anything about him other than that he was a good poker player. Here I lucked out again. He's unique in that he's probably the only poker player who not only knows what the New Yorker is, but reads the New Yorker and has a subscription to it and has a subscription to every single theater company in Manhattan and Brooklyn and knows every single music club and every single newest group and just loves life and loves culture and loves learning. And he just became someone who not only taught me poker, but re-taught me to be excited about everything else. I mean, guy revamped my entire playlist <laughs> and, and a lot of other things. Um, and, and he has a great family, which I think is a, a testament to the fact that you can be good at something and still maintain balance. I mean, he has two daughters who worship him and who, are so, who say he's never missed a single game or a single event in their lives. Um, and that's rare. So I, I chanced on someone who was just good at life. Um, and so I realized very early on that he was going to teach me how to play poker, but he was also going to teach me how to, how to be better, how to be a better person. It's pretty clear from reading your book that he succeeded, and I hope that continues to pay dividends. I can tell you that Eric and I have one, have two things in common. One is we both love poker. You probably figured that out already. But the other is we both have an affection for the New Yorker. And I'd love to spend a little time talking about it and uh, some of your writing for it. Um, sure. on, a, on a personal note, my parents were introduced on a blind date by a friend of theirs who was a longtime writer for the New Yorker. And I got named after the guy. So <laughs> it will always have a, a place in my heart. But do you have a favorite piece that you've written in The New Yorker among many, many, many things that have appeared there? I mean, I don't have a favorite. The most personal thing I ever wrote was I, I um, wrote Walter's obituary for, for The New Yorker, um, which was the hardest thing I've ever written because I didn't want to write it um, because it, it meant that he was dead. Um, and it took me forever. And it's actually the only piece I've ever written for The New Yorker that was late. Um, I'm someone who is very, very good about deadlines. You can talk to any of my editors. I have never submitted copy after deadline, um, unless I've had a very good reason and we've talked about it and the deadline has explicitly been moved. Um, this piece I just wouldn't turn in um, and wouldn't turn in and wouldn't turn in because I just, I couldn't write it. I hadn't written a single word. And then I just wrote it all. Um, and to, so to me, I don't know, it's certainly not my most deeply researched piece. Um, although in a way it is because I lived the research. Um, I just didn't have to do extra research for it. Um, I didn't need to interview anyone for it. I didn't need to go out. I didn't need to, you know, for some of my pieces I traveled many hours to different states and different countries. Um, for this one, I didn't do anything, didn't do any of that. Um, and so it was very different. And I have other pieces that are favorites for other reasons, but this is the one that um, I think will always stay with me because it was meaningful in a way that nothing else I've written for the magazine was. If you don't mind me saying so, it showed. I had a chance to read it before tonight and 
while we've given our audience a reading list already, I would highly commend that piece as something else to take a look at because the love you had for your mentor really shows there and that counts. Thank you. Um, back to poker. For many who have never been to the World Series of poker like you and I have, it's something of a mystery what it's like when you walk into that big room. For some people, they see it on ESPN and they assume that it's lights and cameras and huge crowds flocking around the tables all over the place. For others who don't have any understanding of poker, they think of the poker episode on Friends or maybe if they're of a certain age, the home games that showed up on episodes of The Odd Couple. But can you set the stage for what it's really like when you walk into the Amazon ballroom at the Rio <laughs> Hotel? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's the most bizarre experience in the world. And I won't, I'll never forget the first time that I did it because there's nothing like the first time, right? Afterwards, you kind of get used to it and you stop appreciating a lot of what's going on. But there's just this, this energy there, this kind of this anticipation. Everyone thinks they might get lucky. So this is, this is uh, the, the reason that poker has the appeal that it does, you know, unlike other professional sports where you can't really walk in off the street and say, you know what, this is the year that I win the, <laughs> the NBA <laughs> that I get drafted into, uh, <laughs> you know, into my dream team. This is the year that the ring is mine, you know, whatever, whatever sport you're, you're talking about in poker because it is a it is a game of skill and it is a sport in the sense that you have to have physical endurance and mental strength and all of these different things but there is an element of luck and in the short term in any given tournament anyone can get lucky and so everyone thinks that they might get lucky and there's especially at the beginning of the world series there's just this energy that you can feel i mean you can just you can feel it in the room of everyone just thinking this might be my year this might be my summer this might be my tournament this might be the moment where I capture glory and win and become world famous and win money and prove that I'm actually good and there's nothing quite like it in the main event I was shocked by how silent it can be that there's not this by the time you see it on ESPN, you're already seeing, you know, this is like day seven, day eight um, of the event. And you're seeing everyone's in the money and everyone's excited and talking. And, you know, this is now for the cameras. But at the beginning, everyone is also nervous. And a lot of people have never played before. And this is a once in a lifetime thing. Um, and they're taking their one big shot. I mean, let's just back up a second. The main event costs $10,000 to enter. That is a hell of a lot of money. When you start playing poker professionally, so eventually, spoiler alert, you know, it, it ended up that I was that I was good at poker. Um, I started winning things. I became a sponsored pro. Um, I started playing full time. And when you when you kind of go on the circuit full time, especially when you're around the high stakes players like someone like Eric Seidel, you quickly just become completely. You go you go into this into this alternate universe where people are paying two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to enter a poker tournament, where people are paying a million dollars to enter a poker tournament, where people I mean, and it just is happening all the time. And so, you know, you think, oh, $10,000 tournament. Okay. You know, that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's not a big deal. $25,000. Okay. That's a big deal, but it's, it's not, I mean, that's crazy. Like just take a step back for a second and realize what an insane amount of money this is, right? My first job out of college, my first writing job, my salary was $23,000 a year in New York city. And just think about that for a second. And then I, last year, I played a tournament that cost $25,000 to buy into. My entire salary would not have been able to pay for that buy-in. By the way, I didn't pay for that buy-in, right? I, poker players learn very early on. And I think this is important. I think a lot of people looking from the outside don't realize I'm paying for, I'm playing for a tiny percentage of myself, which means I've sold most of the entry 
to other people. So people can buy percentages of players and it's a way to mitigate risk and to play variants, right? So that if you're running badly, if you're on the wrong side, if you're losing, you don't go broke. And this is very important. It's a life management tool that Eric taught me very, very early on, but it's still a mind boggling amount of money. And so there are people there who they've been saving for years. This is a huge present. This is a huge moment for them to play the main event. Um, it can be life changing. And for many people it is. And that dream, that first day is so alive. I mean, the only thing you can really hear oftentimes is the chips, the, the sound of the chips. And I, I liken it in the book to cicadas because I think that that's really what it sounds like, just this, this incessant chirping. And it's fascinating, it's beautiful, um, it's inspiring, and it's heartbreaking. You have had a great deal of success in a very short period of time. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and I think we can agree that playing poker live in a casino right now would probably be in the top three most unsafe things to do if Anthony Fauci were in our audience. Oh you yeah, I, I would put it probably as number one. I don't know what would be more unsafe. We don't have to decide that question now. It's definitely not a safe thing to do. But my question for you is, if we had a crystal ball and could tell the pandemic was going to go away, given everything else that you've done, everything else that you've accomplished, all of your other interests, do you see yourself staying with poker professionally long term or are there other pursuits you want to move to? I see myself playing poker long term. I don't see myself playing poker full time long term. I think that the level of dedication that it takes to be a professional. So when I, I, I went pro and I played pro for almost two years, um, which meant that all of my income was coming from poker. That's basically the, the definition. Um, and in order to do that, you really have to dedicate everything to it. You have to study, you have to follow the evolution of the game. You have to be on top of it. You have to really be living and breathing it in, in a way that will make you competitive. And, and I was willing to do that. But in the last few years, I averaged about eight months of the year on the road. That's a lot. Um, being a live pro, a live tournament pro takes a toll on you. Um, it takes a toll on your relationships. I mean, I'm married. I went for you know months without seeing my husband and without being home and without actually having a chance to see anyone in my family. I went for multiple months without seeing my parents or my sister or my nieces and nephews. And you know that, that starts to be worrying and it was certainly worth it. And I knew exactly why I was doing it and I loved it and I would never take it. I wouldn't take back a single moment of it. Um, going forward, if we had a crystal ball and knew, you know, okay, pandemic over, vaccines here, everything perfectly safe, um, I would go back to playing for sure, but I wouldn't be playing full time. I think I would be picking my events and really ramping up beforehand because I don't like half-assing things. So if I'm gonna play, I'm going to play. And if I'm going to play an event, you better believe that I'm gonna spend at least a few weeks beforehand really ramping up and preparing and and gearing up and putting everything into place to give myself the best possible shot. Um, so I don't think I'll ever actually go to playing it fully recreationally in the sense of, oh, let me just show up and sit down and play. Um, because to me, that would be disrespectful to the game because I want, I want to do more and treat it with, I think it deserves more. Um, but will I ever be someone who's playing full time? I don't know. As of now, no. But that's also because I had had no plans of stopping um, until the pandemic hit. And then I was suddenly, you know, I haven't left Brooklyn except for, <laughs> except for a trip in July to an Airbnb in uh, New Jersey to play online <laughs> for the World Series of Poker online. I haven't left my Brooklyn apartment since March. And I, that was not 
something that I could have anticipated. I mean, I had had a full poker schedule planned out. My book was out June 23rd. That was supposed to be the middle of the World Series of Poker. That was the week before the main event. I had all of these publicity things lined up in Las Vegas. I was going to be playing a full, I was going to be spending the summer in Las Vegas. So I reassessed and had to kind of pull back because of the pandemic. And so as of now, because of that, I've ramped up other writing projects in other areas. Um, so right now I couldn't go back to playing full time, but who knows what the next year will bring? Who knows what the next two years will bring? One of the things that poker taught me was to be incredibly open-minded about the future because you know what they say about the future? You don't know what's gonna happen. I don't think any of us could. <laughs> Um, I know Aaron has a few audience questions, but I do want to interject one more before we get to that, which is given your experience with Walter Michelle and then later with Eric Seidel, could you see yourself now or in the future post pandemic being a mentor for some other young player who's just starting to learn how to play and who wants to get better if you were approached? Um, I think it depends. I don't think I would be a good coach for someone right now because I think someone who is coaching needs to be someone who's playing and who really knows what's happening in the game. Um, in terms of just life mentoring, I do do a lot of that. Um, and I think that's, that's a very different thing. But both Eric and Walter were people who were much later in their careers and so I think that I think that you have to kind of assess what this person needs and what I have to offer. I've had a lot of people come to me and just ask for coaching, not for mentoring, say, you know, they'd be willing to pay. And more often than not, I send them to someone else. Um, and I know people who are good because I'm a good teacher. I mean, I've, I've taught before and I love teaching. Um, and I think that I'm a good coach for certain things, but not for other things, especially right now. Um, because I do think that someone who's training you needs to be someone who's current and who knows what's going on and what all the trends are. And that's Eric still. I mean, that Eric is someone who's still playing full time. He's in London right now playing a full schedule. He relocated abroad so that he could keep playing full time because you can play poker uh, full time when you're in Europe in a way that you can't uh, in the United States. And so I think you need someone like that if you're actually serious about becoming good at the game. Excellent. Well, Erin, I, I offer to you now, I know there are some questions that came in before and I can see that the chat has brought in a few now. Um, I think Maria and even I are ready if uh, there are questions from the audience. Jeremy, can you tell me, um, we have a question about how old is too old to start learning poker? Um, we have an alum who is a psychology MA from 1955. He says he is 87, and he wonders if it's ever too late to start to learn to play poker. Short answer to that one is no. It could be a lifetime pursuit. It could also be something that you pick up at any time and then get a new hobby when you're no longer interested in it. But I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested. Uh, Maria's book is a great place to start to learn about the game. She does mix in a few uh, discussions of poker basics and how she was learning as she was learning. And she also very cleverly drops in a, a helpful bibliography of other sources that she read. Um, Dan Harrington's book, fittingly called Harrington on Hold'em, is one of the books that appears quite a bit and would be a good read for anyone who wants to learn. Which of the 13 poker game variations do you like the best? So I'm confident that if we gave it enough thought, we could find more than 13 variations, but... Um, I'm just seven, reading the question. <laughs> no, that's fine. Seven card stud high low is the game that I was brought up on, and it's the thing that I've played the most uh, in tournaments. Texas Hold'em, which is what Maria got most of her experience in, and which is written in great detail in her book, is easily the most popular game in the world. In fact, you actually have to really try hard to find tournaments in other games these days. It, it's pretty much a hold them only world. But seven card stud high low has been and probably always will be my favorite. 
I started doing No Limit Hold'em. Um, and the reason I did that was because of the balance of known and unknown information. So I learned from John von Neumann, who was the my inspiration for getting into poker in the first place. He was the father of game theory and game theory was actually inspired by poker. Um, and he looked at a lot of different variations and the amount of information you know versus don't know. And in No Limit Hold'em, the balance is actually the best for figuring out the balance between skill and chance in life because there's just enough unknowns, two cards. Everyone has two whole cards that no one else can see. And that's just about perfect, um, it turns out, in terms of the statistics and the probabilities um, for having a good balance of skill. So other variants of poker, you have way too many whole cards. So there's too much unknown information and it becomes too much like gambling, it becomes a guessing game. In other variants, you only have one unknown card, you have one whole card. And so it becomes too much like chess. And he found chess, von Neumann, profoundly boring because he could solve it because he was also the father of the computer. And he said, you know, give me, give me the computing power and I'll solve chess for you. And obviously the computer has solved chess. There's always a right move. He said, that's not life. In life, there's no right move. Life is not chess. If you wanna actually teach someone to think in a way that's useful for life, don't teach them chess, teach them poker. Thank you. Um, we, um, as a psychologist, um, do you have any um, advice for other poker players about tells? <laughs> what are the most common tells um, and is there any way to deal with them? No, do not look at faces and try to think that you're going to know whether someone is lying or not. Psychology tells us that we are absolutely awful at being able to spot deception. We suck at it. There is no psychological way to reliably tell if someone is lying. And there are psychologists working on this. This is why, by the way, never trust results from a lie detector test. I would completely agree with that. And if you've seen movies or television shows where people give it all away with a tell, that's really fictional at the end of the day and not something you're likely to see in everyday practice. Jeremy, do you have any tips for somebody who is getting better at poker but wants to play professionally? I have one and I, I'm pretty confident Maria would agree with this. A lot of people debate whether poker is luck versus skill or both, and that's a, a general theme of her book. But I would argue, as others do, that it's really a game of making good decisions and teaching good judgment. And all you can hope to do if you're going to be a very good poker player someday is apply that judgment to the information that you have and make the best call that you can under the circumstances. So anyone who is already interested in poker and who's played for a while, I think would benefit greatly yes. if they work on their decision-making skills and, <laughs> and their judgment, remembering that luck is always going to be there or not how you react to the probabilities and using the information you do have is something you can control. Thank you. Um, Rhea, we're talking about tips for people that are, that are getting better at poker and may want to play professionally. And I also want to mention that um, we have a few people that are pretty starstruck by you and they are, <laughs> I think it, maybe this will be the last question. Just if you have any tips for people um, who are, you know, trying to ramp up their poker game and thinking that they might like to play professionally. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I think there are no shortcuts. And I think that you will do yourself a disservice if you think there are shortcuts. I, yeah, I did get very lucky that I was able to succeed pretty quickly. But I did this full time. I left the New Yorker to study poker full time. So I spent seven days a week eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 hours a day studying poker, learning poker. Every single day I was either playing or watching someone else play, reviewing hands, reviewing my own play, reviewing someone else's play, watching videos and actually actively watching videos and studying and taking notes and talking to people and learning from people. And I think that's the only way to do it. If you're very serious about it, you're all people who know how to study. That's something that I also know well. This 
is like an intense language immersion course. Think of it as that class where you actually had to learn a foreign language in one semester and you hated it because it was the class that started at eight in the morning and you had to come because if you didn't, you were going to fail. I, I took those classes. That's what this is. And that's how you have to approach it as full immersion. And I think that that's, that's my tip to you. And it's not a, oh, if you just do this, then all of a sudden you'll be great. There, there are tips for plugging very elementary mistakes that people make. And of course, I can give that to you in 10 minutes and you're going to become a better player. But if you're actually thinking about taking this seriously, you have to, you have to treat it seriously. You have to actually immerse yourself in this world and do so actively so you have to want to do it as with anything you're going to learn much better if you're passionate about it if you actually are motivated intrinsically and that's the that's the other thing that i got from eric he doesn't play for the money sure he's made a lot of money but that's because he's very good and he's very good because he plays for the game he plays for the process he plays for the learning for the challenge for what it teaches him about his own mind and about thinking clearly and about learning how to think better and constantly improve because the money you can't control that's the outcome and the whole point of poker is that you shouldn't be focused on the outcome you should be focused on the process you should be putting yourself in a position to statistically speaking win but that might mean that you go through long periods of time when you're losing as well and that's perfectly okay and so i think that Ultimately, you have to be motivated by the right things, not by the gold stars, <laughs> but, by, uh, but by the actual process of learning. Well, thank you very much, Maria, and thank you very much, Jeremy. And um, I think that, that despite the technical difficulties, I think that we got lucky tonight to have, uh, to have you speak to us, and it was a really fantastic conversation. Um, and I urge people to, to, um, to pick up Maria's book and, um, some of her other writing. Um, I just want to mention that Columbia at Home will be taking next week off to celebrate the end of summer. Um, and you can check alumni.columbia.edu next week for information about our next program. Um, and uh, those of you who are GSAS alums, uh, GSAS Conversations will return in September. Um, and thank you all to everyone who attended. And again, thank you so much to Maria and Jeremy for sharing so much with us. Um, it was really fascinating to, to listen to you have this conversation that you both clearly know so much about and you're both so passionate about. So um, thank you to Maria and Jeremy. Thank you to everyone that was, that stuck it through with us tonight and uh, be well and stay well.